Hey everybody, Sean Keating here. I want to welcome you to the Dental Up Podcast Show by Keating Dental Arts, where anything goes and nothing stays. Get the latest clinical focuses in dental and thought-provoking spins on the most viral topics out there. Join us every week for the most mind-enhancing ways to grow your practice, mixed with lifestyle, sports, news, and topics that don't suck. Hey everybody, Sean Keating here. I'd like to welcome you to this week's episode of the Dental Up Podcast here at Keating Dental Arts in beautiful Irvine, California. My guest today graduated from Muhlenberg College and attended the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. He was also accepted into a one-year general practice residency program at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Reading, Pennsylvania. In 2007, he purchased Forest North dental that has been serving the community for 30 years. He is part of the faculty on the SarahDoctors.com website and at the Scottsdale Center for Dentistry and the CADCAM division. Finally, he created the Northern Illinois Sarek Study Club, which is one of the largest CADCAM study clubs in the USA. Currently practicing in Lake Forest, Illinois, please welcome Dr. Rich Rosenblatt, DMD. How's it going, Dr. Rosenblatt? Did you just call me Dr. Rosenblatt? <laughs> Rich, what's up, baby? How you doing? Let's be real. <laughs> I'm like, who the hell are you? <laughs> oh, Dr. Rosenblatt. <laughs> oh, man. That's so... What's up, man? Thanks for having me on this podcast. Uh, dude, that's so cool, man. I, I know you've been busier and heck, we we're going to do it before the start of the day. Then you were swamped and then we we're going to do it at lunchtime and you're just like, killed with you know patience and then okay let's do it afterwards so here we are uh, a couple days for the midwinter and dude thank you so much man i don't think i've ever done a podcast on a tuesday but uh it's taco tuesday man we're gonna have to wrap this up pretty damn quick baby <laughs> You know, you and I can do Taco Tuesday real well. Oh, dude, we could do anything together real well. I love you, man. You're funny as hell. And I've been I've been with you doing things for years, man. But how's everything else there, man? Is it cold out in Chicago or what, man? What do we got to look forward to coming up here? Well, we got something that you never have been seen in a while called rain. We got a little rain today. Okay. Um, it's been, um, I know you had that heavy rain a couple months ago, but yeah. it's, it was about 60 degrees today. So it was beautiful as far as temperature-wise going to get down into the 30s by the time you come here high 40s by the weekend so not too bad oh that's not bad at all man me and my blood pressure i love the cold now and then so you know my, my wife shannon she's like oh god she she doesn't like that coldness <laughs> but uh oh, dude no i can't wait i freaking just love chicago i love the food there man i got so many places and so little time you know to go eat what do you got on your on your agenda to eat where are you going you know i don't know i'm a big pizza guy so i do a couple of the pizza places I mean, i'm big lou malnati still to this day but uh heck i even get those damn frozen things mailed to my fat ass you know it's like you like thick are you a thick pizza guy or a thin pizza guy? you know i'm a thin guy but i like lou malnati's thick uh you know i just love their you know pepperoni and their vegetarian even i mean we're kind of hooked on those things man. they're pretty neat but uh there's a couple other ones that are pretty good. Even, too, at Luminati's, they got a thin one that's pretty damn good there. We always get one of those, too, on the side. So, <laughs> Take Shannon to this restaurant called Nelcoat, N-E-L-L-C-O-T-E. Great restaurant. I go there all the time. They got this crazy – they own, they have a couple of pizzas. They have great food in general. Okay. But they have a few – they have Neapolitan-style ovens that, like, cook the pizza real fast and, and yeah. at a high temperature. And, dude, they make – they have a great kind of uh, margarita pizza, but they make their own sausage there. They get a sausage, and the, the thing I love more than anything, arugula and, a, and a two eggs on the top of the pizza, and they cook it like that. It's ridiculous. You got you to gotta try it. Oh, I definitely will, man. I'm always looking for new places. I told Shannon the other day, I go, yeah, I can't wait. And she goes, we're not going to Palms. You know, the Palm is like for lunch. I used to go there and pull a lobster out of a tank or whatever. But yeah, we've always done that. So we'll probably switch up a few times, different places this year and uh, try some other things, man. So, hey, did I always like to start off talking a little bit about sports. So what's going on with you, man? You, you big, uh, you know, I know you're big, you know, Chicago Cubs. Are you a big Cubs fan or stuff? Baseball is ready to start up here. What do you think about, uh, is that your team in baseball? And what about football? What you no, think? I'm a Met fan. I grew up in Jersey, so okay. I like East Coast guy. I, I'm a Met, New Jersey Net, uh, New York Giants, 
And I used to be an Islander fan, but I, I, it was just too hard to follow him out here. Okay. So I kind of converted into a Blackhawk fan since I've been out here. But I don't. I like the Chicago teams, but I'm still a diehard. Like New York Giants bleed blue. Oh, that's so I cool, bleed. dude. I know. I was just reading up all your. Uh, you got a. You got so much stuff to. I could have. You know. I think it was the longest bio I've done is on you, and you got all sorts of stuff. But Jersey boy, what part of uh, where'd you grow up? And uh, was it New Jersey or New York? Where'd you grow up exactly? No? I grew up on the coast, uh, Jersey Shore, on the about an hour outside of New York City in a small town called Wayside. It was, it's about three, four miles outside of Asbury Park would be the biggest town that people know. You know, a little Bruce Springsteen love right yeah. there. So um, that's where I grew up. So it was uh, always kind of a, an ocean kid no uh, most of my life and got that, you know, I, I grew up on the New York side of Jersey, not the Philly side when you get down to like Atlantic City and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. So it's um, not, not the Jersey Shore type place a little bit. It's, it's only about 10 to 15 minutes north of where that maybe 15, 20 minutes north of where all that took place. So yeah, not that far from it. So I get to see a lot of that uh, G- GTL going on. No kidding. What about, um, so tell me a little bit about the Olympics. Are you watching that? I'm not really watching too much of the Winter Olympics. A little bit of the giant slalom stuff I, like that. I love the Winter Olympics. I'm a winter guy. You know, when you're big and, well, I'm big, but when you're little and beefy, you <laughs> love, like you I like the cold weather. I've been a skier, diehard skier my whole life. Um, so uh, it, it's like my favorite thing to do. So I'm, I've always kind of resonated more with the uh, Winter Olympics that I do the summer. And what's really good, one of these years, I'm going to try to organize this next year, Keats. Yep. Right down the street from my, so I'm about 25 minutes outside of Chicago, just north of the city. Okay. I'm going to try to organize. There is a curling center right down the street, like 10 minutes from my house, so about 25 minutes north of the city. And um, for 75 bucks per person, we can get a curling lesson, play a game, and get pizza and beer. You tell me that doesn't sound like a killer couple of hours. Dude, we could be doing tiddlywinks, and I'm in, you know. With, when you put pizza and beer in there, I'm all – I was just at Lucille's, this little local barbecue place at lunch, and on the TV was the curling, and I'm going, look at these guys with these brooms, man. <laughs> but it's like that shuffleboard. We do that in little bars out here, uh, you know, the big shuffleboards. They throw the dust on it, and, oh, I love yeah. – I can play that all night with my buddies. You, know, you knock them out of their spot, and – yeah, well, that's a fun game. Almost, I wanted to get one for the house. My wife said, "You know what, dude? You ain't getting. You got a pool table. You got all this ain't you know kitty romper room in here anymore." So we couldn't get that big shuffle. It wasn't a shuffleboard. It's what's it called with the metal things? Is that? I don't know what it's called, but I love that game. They put like the cornmeal on there. And yeah, they just throw it. I love that. Oh, that's oh. so great. And then they had the shuffleboard. I think that's the one on the ground where you got the little stick, you push it. Yep. But, uh, oh, Correct. that's fun times. But, yeah, that curling, that's kind of a trip watching. You really got to know how hard to throw it because some are short and some are off to the side. But the way they do those brooms, man, it's like, eh. yeah, I think uh, who was it? Uh that one actress on Cheers said some stuff how, oh, I don't like the curling and the uh, Internet's kind of – Kicking her butt oh, yeah. right now, yeah. What? What? I forgot don't her name. Really yeah, don't mess around, man. Those people on the interweb will come after you, man. <laughs> well, dude, let's dental up a little bit here now, right. Rich. Tell me right. now, why did you get into dentistry, and at what point did you think I want to be a dentist? So I knew I wanted to be a dentist when I was eight years old. My dad's <laughs> a dentist, and uh, so I think you met my dad before. One of the couple. Oh of the yeah, he's, he's a great, there. great guy. <laughs> he, he's definitely a trip. <laughs> and so I, so I knew I wanted to be, a, a, you know, I've always kind of been interested in it. And then, um, and then I went to college and I uh, was at Muhlenberg and Muhlenberg's kind of like a pre-med factory kind of a place for, okay. uh, does a great job placing people into medical and dental school. So I went in there and I was, a, you know, I did well in high school and stuff. And then I got to college and I realized, oh my God, we don't have to go to class. This is awesome. <laughs> and so, so I started out pre-med. And um, I always tell this story when I kind of talk about my journey to get to where I am today. And when you talk about, you know, I talk to kids all the time, like, you know, even my kids and stuff about it's okay to fail. You know, we're always so worried about letting people know that we messed up a little bit in life. And sometimes it's about, you know, it's about messing up and learning that, you know, just because you fall flat on your face, it doesn't mean anything. So I, I, I didn't do too well my first year. I got a 3 my first year at Muhlenberg, but that was a one, three and a one, seven, my first two semesters. Okay. So they, so I kind of got booted out of the pre-med program after about the third semester and I was, and I became a psych major and that's what I graduated with. I graduated with a psychi- psychology degree Oh, you're kidding. and, um, and I was going to be, I, and I always wanted to teach. 
So I figured I'll just become a teacher. And my dad, when I graduated, said, so you wanted to be a dentist since you were eight. Now you want to be a psych professor, huh? I said, <laughs> well, I don't know. I'll figure it out. And so he said, come and work for me as a dental assistant and let's see what, what you think. And um, I've, t- I've said this story a lot of times to friends and stuff that my dad's probably the best dentist I've ever seen practice in my life. His, his skill set, his hands were awesome. incredible, uh, what awesome. he could do artistically. And so I, so I learned a lot. He was, you know, we definitely butted heads a ton. We wanted to kill each other a couple of times <laughs> when, we were, when we were working. Yeah. But I learned a ton from him. And so I went back. I decided, you know what, this is what, I'm, this is what I want to do. So I went back to college. I went back and did my, all my science classes over again and got a 4.0 in my sciences. And I uh, eventually, after my third, my third year out, got into dental school oh. and kind of, uh, and, you know, kind of worked out from there. So I kind of, you know, had to work hard to get to where I wanted to be again. But ever since, once I got in, I, I've never, never looked back. When, you know, a quick story of one of the guys who, the guy who let me into dental school, mm-hmm. um, when I graduated, my, when I got married, I got married my senior year. He came up to me and he said, listen, you know, when you graduated, you know, you had a real, you're one of the worst transcripts I've ever seen as far as what you did in, in medical in college. And I said, I know. And he said, you told me that if I let you in, you would, I would remember you, you know, for, for a long time to come. And I ended up helping uh, another gentleman in school start a, um, a program uh, that, you know, that was kind of continued on in my school for a few years after I graduated. And he ended up putting my name in for a leadership scholarship. And I ended up winning this $5,000 scholarship right before my honeymoon. And he said, yeah. I'm really proud of everything you've done. You've come a long way. Here's $5,000. Go and enjoy your honeymoon. Oh, and so man. I've always, you know, it was just a great, you know, for me, I knew from the day I got into dental school that if I died and came back to life, I'd be a dentist again. Can you believe that? And at such a young age, you had yep. that. There's a couple other guys that said something similar to that, at a young age that they knew they were going to be a dentist. And that's amazing. He's had the perseverance to stay with it. And shit, I thought 2.0 was like, uh, D was for diploma, man. Is that only in high school? Or I guess you got to get it higher, huh? <laughs> In your case, you, you did you want to be a, a tech early? I mean, how did you kind of get into that thing with you? Exactly. See, my oldest brother, I'm the youngest of four boys, and then I have two younger sisters, but my oldest brother, Kevin, his teeth were jacked up always, I remember, and I was real small when he was going through issues. He's about six, seven, eight years older than me, and... Anyway, so he was going at high school. He knew he wanted to be a dentist because he had to go to the orthodontist. His teeth were going every which way and had some issues. And for some reason, my teeth came in perfect. Who knows? My mom was always left at home alone. My dad was all fighting the wars. So we all look different. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, anyway, so Kevin got into the dental field, was going to school for it, you know, his JUCO, you know, junior college and then getting his stuff together. And then the Navy gave him a scholarship. But anyways, when he was just interning right out of high school, he would, I was just playing football since like eight years old in junior peewee, you know, peewee football. And uh, yep. I remember by the eighth grade, my brother Kevin would start making me these custom mouthpieces. And he worked at this little town, you know, a couple, we were, grew up in Huntington Beach, but he worked over in Bellflower. And so I would go in the summer and help him while he was working. You know, he'd give me a few bucks, you know, to help him out around the lab and stuff in the dental office. And we started making mouthpieces. So like from eighth grade on, 12, 13, I knew I, he always said Sean because I never was real good in school. I was good in sports, and I just kind of you know he was always so brainy and smart. And uh, he said to me, Sean, you're going to be a dental technician. I'm going to be a dentist. You can work for me. And so I always knew in my head I was going to be a, de- a dental technician, man, dental laboratory technician. I'm working my brother Kevin and. Lo and behold, long story short, I was going to dental technology school and he was already a dentist and all this stuff. And he was in the Navy. The Navy gave him a four year scholarship to USC, paid for everything. And then he was in the Navy and he goes, you know, Sean, uh, guess what? I'm 20 years old. He goes, just finishing dental technology school. And I remember my dental teacher at school, I wasn't real good. And like freaking towards the end of the course, like it's a year course. He goes, Sean, you know what, man, come here. He goes, I really think you might think about going into dentures because, you know, and I'm like, dude, my brother's a dentist. I'm one fixed prosthodontics. I ain't doing no dentures. And he like, the guy's name was Kurt. And I remember he was a chiropractor for a regular job and dental technician on the side, teacher, blah, 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 helping the school out. And he was, you know, 
I don't know, kind of young college dude, a little not too older, much older than us. And he was just like, eh, all right. And then next thing you know, my brother tells me, hey, Sean, the Navy put me in for two more years to specialize in endodontic, so I'm not going to be doing any fixed work, and I'm only going to be doing endo. We I'm have a practice limited to endodontics, and I didn't really think a whole lot. And I'm like, well, shit, I can make you some posts and stuff. He goes, ah, I don't know about that, Sean. He goes, you're on your own. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> so I'm sitting there uh, thinking, I'm going to these labs. I started off, and I, lo and behold, I... I started uh, Glidewell Laboratories. It's called Orange Dental Ceramics, man, 1984. And I was a metal finisher. I went in there and interviewed with Jim Glidewell himself. And I said, you know what? My brother's a dentist. Someday I'm going to open a lab. And I remember Jim telling me, he goes, well, Sean, I've had people here for 20 years, and they could have opened labs, but they stay with me, and um, I, you know, provide them medical, all this stuff, and I'm like thinking, well, this is 84. I know you started in 1970, so it's only been 14 years you've been in business, so he's already told me he's got guys over 20 years, but anyways, uh, it, it worked out good <laughs> that my brother Kevin still looks at me and goes, man, Sean, he goes, I remember when I told you I'm going to be an endo, and you're all like crying on the phone and saying because he was in North Carolina or whatever and I go yeah what am I going to do Kevin I thought I was going to work for you because you'll be fine and now he looks at me and goes you know what Sean I go on vacation the business stops I make no money you go on vacation you got a hundred people working for you making you money he goes who's doing better me or you and I'm like thinking to myself I think, well, yeah. I, I, think I am baby <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah so from a young yeah, age well, kind of a long yeah. story but uh, nah dude that that is so cool. So tell tell me a little bit about when you got out of dental school and stuff, you did a residency. Now, for some of us who don't know, what's a residency, what's a residency program? You did that at St. Jo Joseph's Medical Center. Tell me a little bit about a residency program, what it entails. When I came out of school, I actually qualified. I was in a very a special program that my dental school started my senior year of, co of uh, dental school where we went out instead of being in the dental school itself and working in the clinic, seeing like a patient in the morning and a patient in the afternoon, and you have to wait for the professors to check off your crap and it takes forever. Okay. My school started a pilot program where they had satellite clinics in some of the underserved areas of the state. And so they put me and three other uh, senior dental students in one of these clinics with one doctor overseeing us. And we have two front desk people. We each had our own dental assistant. And I saw like seven, eight patients a day like I did in a dental office. Okay. So I finished all my requirements early. I was doing all kinds of stuff. And I felt pretty confident, but I really felt like I probably should go out and do a residency, which is in a residency. This one was hospital-based. Sometimes they're in like a um, – uh, Like a medical a, center you know, a military, or something. Okay. Yeah, they'll do like a you know, a, a, you know one of the military hospitals and stuff like that. Um, and so – the, and then they have one called an AGD, Advanced Education and General Dentistry, which oh, okay. doesn't do so much the hospital stuff. It's more the practice side of things. I just wanted to – I figured it would be really neat to sort of learn a little bit on the medical, kind of rotate through. I rotated through with the family practice doctors. I was on call in the in the ER, on the OR. I had to ride with EMTs for a week. I did all kinds of stuff okay. while still practicing. So, so it was a good time. I enjoyed it. And, you know, I'm looking to hire, I just hired an associate now. And I'll tell you, I was really, I either wanted three or four years experience or somebody who came out and wanted to, you know, do a residency program because it just felt like I got a lot of experience there. It was funny. I was in Reading, Pennsylvania and no disrespect to Reading, but it's, you know, it's kind of, a, it's, it's not the, the, it's not like a metropolis of any sort there. Okay. And so my wife and I were living out there and a couple of months in my director ended up leaving and he got he moved up to in Penn State uh, in their hospital system up there was going to be practicing up that way. And he said to me, "I think you'd be a great director of the residency program here." And he goes, "I know you like to teach, and I, you know you got a lot of energy. You'd be I think you'd be really good to lead this." And I was so excited. I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm going to be like a director of a residency." I went home. My wife was pregnant. He, you know, did not like living out there. And I said, "Honey, I got I just got offered the director of the residency program at St. Joseph's." And she was with her teeth. Black. She goes, "If you make me stay in Reading, we're done." I'm like, "Okay, I guess I'm not staying in Reading." So didn't didn't take that job, but but I certainly learned a lot, and it was a, it was a great experience. And then after a year, we got out and we kind of went up the Eastern Seaboard looking for a place because we I wanted to live somewhere on the East Coast where my family was. 
Um, I had a, my family had a ski place in Vermont, and I always loved the ocean and the mountains. And I figured East Coast are close enough to both okay. that I could kind of tickle both my things. And then we ended up out in Rhode Island for about a year. And then my wife just said, "No, nah, I want to." We had our first kid, and she wanted to move to Chicago, so we uh, left my residency, worked for about a year out in like the Mystic Seaport area of okay. Connecticut. And then um, came out here to Chicago in 2000, 1999. No kidding. So a year or two associating. And then when you came to Chicago, did you associate there? Or did you just open up a practice? How'd that go? I found an amazing, he, he is my mentor still to this day. Great guy. Awesome. Um, tremendous practice. It was a big practice in um, in an area that was kind of just turning over in um, just out in Chicago on the, just west of the 1994 there. And so, um, and he was a visionary even back then, you know, in 98, he was chartless and, and uh, everything was digital back then. 2003, we went and bought, um, you know, he, he was very progressive and he thought, if you see something you like, let me know. Okay. And we got into Seric together at the same time. So in 2003, he bought the first Seric machine that I was ever exposed to after we went to a course. And, you know, my, my life has really changed ever since then. Um, he got me into Invisalign. He taught me how to do wisdom teeth extractions. He sent me to my first implant course. I mean, everything that, you know, you would want to do to become a, a legitimate general dentist. Uh, we, I have so much of it to owe to him. Oh, that is so cool. And, you know, it is. It's so Very true. Crazy, uh, by the way. Who starts out in your career and some of them mentor you and some they are just miserable with what they've learned. But uh, that's awesome. And, and the guy's he still, he's still practicing, huh? Oh God, yeah. He's he's probably in his uh, mid to late sixties. He looks like he's about fifty. The guy works out like a like a fiend. Um, he just, he's a, he's a he's a really you know uh, he was one of the most giving people to me as far as uh, helping me along the way and really making me grow into what I am uh, as a as a clinician today. And not that that's anything you know to to go crazy about, but I'm a I'm a, you know I'm an everyday bread and butter dentist. I just do it as well as I can. And I have a, a pretty wide field of stuff that I do. And he taught me one thing he always told me was, you know, he worked hard. He was in real estate and did a lot of stuff. So he was doing okay financially. Mm -hmm. But he said, the one thing that I always invest in is myself. Cause I know that's the one investment that I know that I'm always going to work hard enough to make it pay off. Oh, so and cool. so I've always, once I got out, I always kind of went with that as I got out in my practice because I just figured that I know how hard I work mm -hmm. and that there might just probably be some bumps along the road, but you know, I figure out a way to make it happen. That is so cool. I mean, that's a great story there. And how was he when you left to open down, when you left him, did you go to open up your own practice or did you go work somewhere so, else? Yeah, or? This, this was really the, 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 the thing that made me understand that what a great guy he was. Well, I remember, first of all, he didn't, we, he never made me sign a contract. So we, we, I worked on a handshake for 10 years oh, beautiful. and I said, well, you know, what if I decide to leave? There was a building next door. I said, what if I decide to open up a dentistry, a thing right next door? He said, open up the yellow pages. He said, I have the very, this is back in 99. Mm -hmm. He had a double truck. He was the number one ad in the downtown Chicago yellow pages, double truck, both sides. Oh, those, I mean, who knows what the hell those oh, things cost back oh, in the day. Big money, you know? I'm getting a hundred patients, new patients a month. You think I'm worried if you open up next door, go ahead and do it. Good luck. Oh. So I was like, you know what? I love that about him because he just knew that, you know, whatever happened. Well, the one thing that I always wanted to do is I always did want to buy in with him. Okay. And um, so I tried a couple of times and his daughter, who is a dentist also, his youngest daughter, mm -hmm. uh, loved, you know, great kids. She wanted to be a dentist, but she was a sophomore in, in college. And, and I told him at that point, I said, I want to think about buying in. And he said, well, my daughter's thinking about coming in and I want to kind of figure out what she wants to do. And I said, listen, she's a sophomore. I can buy in the percentage now. And it didn't work out that way. And, but he was very fair in, in kind of reimbursing me in other ways to sort of make it worth my while. So I did it for a few more years, but I didn't want to be my, I'm 48 now. I didn't want to be in my early to mid forties and have no equity somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this offer, this office that I bought came up for sale in Lake Forest. I had no idea how to run a business. I was a tooth mechanic and that's what I did. Yep. And so, um, but this thing came up, I didn't have any money to really look at higher attorneys and stuff. So I just kind of went with my gut. Could have been one of the worst business decisions I've ever made in all honesty. But when I, when I ended up buying it, I did not tell him I went behind his back and did it. And then I came into work the day I signed the thing. And I said, listen, I just want to let you know that I bought a practice and it's, you know, 30, 20 something miles away. It's not going to be anything. 
I said, but I'd still like to work here because I got to build this practice up some. Yep. He said, you can stay here as long as you want. He goes, you know, tell me the days you can work. And so, but he said, I have to hire somebody. He said, how long can you give me? I said, you know what? I hired the guy I bought the office from for uh, about two months. And I said, I'll give you 60 days and I'll work here full time and I'll have him cover my shifts until you can find somebody. So I let him find someone and he let me work there until the other guy sort of transitioned into my spot. And, um, and my lecturing career kind of took off and I just couldn't make it work there anymore. So, but I stayed on probably another three years after I bought. So he was amazing. He was really, um, still is amazing. He's a great guy. That is a stay. That's, that's a perfect scenario how that worked. And that is so cool, dude. Now, what about now? Don't you have like another practice or so, or tell me, uh, is it just the one practice? So I, I bought this practice in 07. Oh, you know, and I, so what I bought my practice, I bought my Ceric machine the same day, signed the note on both. And then, um, and I found out that this practice basically averaged about 10 new patients a year. I didn't know that I didn't do that. <laughs> but and we weren't really uh, bringing home a lot of new patients in here. So this thing was kind of dying on the vine a little bit. Okay. And um, I was trying to spend money and I was burning through money like crazy. And, um, and then what happened a year later, the market crashed, oh. and I was just hemorrhaging money. But the weird, a weird thing kind of happened. Samir, you know, is one of my best friends, Puri. Yep. And uh, Samir had uh, not only does he does he did he start, you know, he's one of the founders of Cirrus Doctors, but he also started the townie meeting, as you know. Yep. And so one the first, one of the year, two thousand and seven, he said, I want to start a Cirrus track. And he goes, I want you to lecture. And I've never, I, I ran a little study club here, yeah. but it wasn't, it was, you know, 30 people in it. And I had lectured at it maybe 10 times. He goes, I want you to lecture. You know, he knew me from dental town and yeah. all the cases I posted and stuff. So I, so I did. And then a year later, Sarek doctors, it was, he had already started. He brought me on as faculty at Sarek docs. And then my lecture career went crazy. So as soon as the market crashed and the practice wasn't growing, my lecture career went off the charts yes and so um so i was able to kind of balance both and then last two years ago uh in january one of the guys someone in my town a great dentist uh suddenly passed from cancer diagnosis to death was like three weeks or something like that and so he died quickly and um I had found out about it and I, I didn't want to buy it because I was just about to pay off my practice. Yeah. And so I had like five months left and I'm like, I just want to get out from my note and just kind of slowly grow my practice the way I've been doing. And, um, and I tried not to buy it. Long story short, the family came up to me and uh, really said, I, I'd like you to buy the practice. My t- I was helping them out with emergencies uh-huh. for free because he didn't have anybody working for him. And I was scared that everyone in my town was just going to kind of pick the, the practice apart. And he would, and his family wouldn't get anything. And I just felt like at 63 years old, the family deserved to get something for that practice that he worked 34 years to, to build. So I said, you, I will see every patient that needs an emergency exam, needs a crown cemented that he didn't get a chance to cement. I'll do it at no charge. I don't care. And the, I guess the, the patients kept saying that it was nice, but I said, I will not take any patients. You have to hire somebody. I am not applying. I'm not trying to buy the place. Well, they convinced me to buy it. I ended up buying the practice. It doubled the size of my building here. And they were three-tenths of a mile down the street from me. So we closed that facility because it was much older. Okay. I brought them into here, and now we are going gangbusters now. So wow. two years later, we're starting my first associate, and it's like a nut house in here. Oh, that's so cool. How many ops you got working in there? So that's the problem. We're trying – we're I have a small 1,150-square-foot office. We have four operatories. So I'm like – I'm now going – doing some, like, split schedule stuff with my – trying to – the associate starts Thursday, actually, okay. her first day. And so, like, Thursdays, we're doing a split schedule so I can add some evening. She's adding a Friday for me because we don't have Fridays. So we're just going to go to longer hours. Yeah. And I'll kind of work a few mornings and a few evenings and try to build it that way until I can figure out how to build something else, which I'm looking at. And, I'm, you know, we're, we're trying to see if we can expand in the building I'm at or do I have to move or whatever. So... Um, so all good stuff, man. All good stuff. Oh, that's so cool. Maybe I'll get some more implants from you, dude, and get some more. Uh, I know yeah. you do a lot of those single onesie twosies I used to do, but now uh, those implants. What about uh, the associate? Uh, what kind of uh, talents they got? Uh, just raw or pretty, pretty, uh, pretty skill? Got some skills? Your new, your new partner there? She's uh, she three, three or four years out of school. Uh, loved, you know, one of the things I learned in my office. I have the same team that I've had 
since I started. Um, the 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 front desk and the so in the and not the hygienist, the assistant had been here for like twenty years. They they actually hired me. Oh. You know, they interviewed a lot of doctors who wanted to buy the practice, and they said I want him yeah. to be the new dentist. Oh, you're so just... they hired me, and I kind of took on that mentality for all of the hires I've done since. If I hire somebody in the back, I let my assistant do all the interviewing. Oh, if I'm hiring somebody in the front, I let the front desk. And now with the associate, I let the whole team do it because I said your guys are going to be the ones working with yeah. whoever we hire. So you got to love them. So I would I would do all of the like an hour interview on the phone, and if they got past me, yep. then they come in and the get peppered with questions from the team. Yeah, and then they interviewed probably twelve or fifteen people, and I was in Boston doing a, you know, at an event that the Dead Spy of Serono was putting on. Yep. and they called me out of nowhere. They're like, "We found her. This is the one." I'm like, "All right, let's do it." Oh, that's so, so perfect. We do that too with key hires, and I'll I'll get if they get past me, then you know, got to go to the staff, you know, management, and they all spend about twenty minutes each with a person, and it's up to them because they got to work with them, and you know, it's just once it gets past the the main person, it, it's the best way to do it, man. Oh, that's that's sweet. So, what about uh? She got any uh, Cerex skills or? She the, they have an Itero in her place. She just she loves Invisalign, so she does a fair amount of Invisalign. So we'll bring. I do it, but I think she'll bring in that way more to the practice than we've had before. And you know, I think she's just she's very. The reason I really enjoyed her, she's got a, she's very eager to learn. So she came in here. She was going to come to one of my local basic training courses, and then it got snowed out like two weeks ago. So she's like, well, I'd really like to learn. I said, well, I'm off on Monday mornings just doing paperwork. Come on up for a few hours. And she came up early in the morning, sat here for like three or four hours. And I, tra her and my new front desk, who used to be a Sarah trainer with me, and I hired her to do some front desk stuff. Okay. They're going to be working together. So the two of them and me were kind of, you know, training here in the office. And so I'm looking forward to somebody who is very eager to, you know, I didn't know anything when I was the associate at my old place. And I look at what my my old boss, Gary, did for me as a mentor and as a friend. And I'd like to do the same thing. I don't necessarily need somebody to come in and crush it. I need them to have some character and I need them to take pride in their work. And I need them to have drive to want to learn more stuff. And we'll, you know, I'll teach you what I can. And then we'll go out together as a team and learn the stuff that we don't know how to do that we want to bring in, you know, that we think can bring great Thanks to our patients. Oh, Rich, that is just, uh, that's the gospel right there, man. I mean, shit, I want to hire you. I love you. You're, that's awesome. You need to, that's that attitude you got to have to be successful in anything. I mean, even to give them that information out. I remember my old boss, you know, uh, he would tell any other lab guy everything that he does. And he was always that way. And it's just because, you know, there's just a ton of work out there and the cream always rises yep. to the top. And you know what? You just give out that information and it's just, um, it's important because, you know, it's just, uh, it just goes for so, so far for the character of the person. And so that, that's just really neat. I'm sure she's going to be real successful. What's the wife think about having a female uh, associate? Not a problem there. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you know, my, I don't my think wife, so. You know, well, you better know. Just kidding. Uh, my wife is the most chill. She that that's the last thing she she doesn't get to think about any of that stuff. And you know, for me, um, I, I didn't care whether it was male or female coming mm -hmm. through. I wanted again. I really wanted the team to find somebody that they that they loved and they felt like this is the one. And whoever that one was, as long as I could meet them and also get that same kind of feeling. I was all in on them. I didn't really care. I wanted them to just have that ability to, to feel like they could bond. And if they felt that it was a female that they could bond with, then that's great. You know, I mean, she's young, single, you know, no big. So I think she's got a, an ability to, to, to have a lot of freedom right now to do yeah. whatever. If we want to do some CD stuff, if I want to send her, I think she's just going to be gung-ho to do anything I want to do as far as, new things i wonder oh she also does botox and stuff like that too which i don't do yeah so i think having that in her, in her wheelhouse is also pretty nice oh it'll be awesome dude i mean really you could really just push that practice into a whole nother realm right now with that and do you do much yeah. uh social media with your marketing yet or are you going to be doing more of that how tell me a little bit about your uh how you drive practice your uh, patients to your practice and what do you what are you using out there i, I have really been doing a ton. I, I would say that the, the way we do it right now is very generic in that, you know, we, we take a couple of PPOs so that we get new patients that way. Okay. We get a lot of word of mouth. I mean, we are, I'm, I'm, I have a mentality of 
you know, treating patients. I, you know, I, my dad, when, when you talk about like practice philosophies, one my dad taught me when I worked for him as a dental assistant, he sat me down one day and said, if you want to have a successful dental practice, you only have to know two things. He said, do you know what they are? I said, well, you got to do a great crown or I didn't, you know, what the hell yeah. did I know? I was 18, 20, whatever years old. He goes, he goes, no, no, you're so far off. He said, the two things you have to know how to do are number one, talk to your patients like they're your friend or family. You go in there, you, you don't sit around and just sit down and look in their mouth. You ask them, you know, where are you from? What brought, you know, uh, what do you like to do for fun? Find every time you ask a question, find something to connect with it to bring on another conversation and get some connections that way. Do that three or four times before you even get to what's bothering you today. He said, because if you do that and they feel that, that emotional connection, they're in there for the long haul. He said, the number two, learn how to give a great injection. And he would make me practice on tomatoes. He would have a tomato and he'd, he'd make He'd make me shake the tomato like I was shaking a cheek and then put it in. And if I squeezed the, the plunger too fast to inject to it, he'd scream behind me. And I'd be like, what the hell are you doing? Oh, and he'd be like, that's what the patient's going to do if you pump that in that fast. Slow the hell down. Oh. And so he would time me. And i give the slowest injections. And still to this day, I go, I go forever. But the patients are always like, that felt great. Yep. He said, my dad said, at the end of the day, patients know two things about you. Was he nice to me and did he hurt me? He said, if you want to be a great dentist, technically, that's on you, but patients have no idea what that means. Oh. They think that the, the greatest dentist is the one that does that five-surface amalgam and is patching everything, but they're the greatest guy in the world or gal in the world. That's who they think a great dentist is, and they tell everyone about it. So exactly. be that guy from there, and then if you want to become a great dentist, which you should, then take the initiative to go to all these courses, do, you know, Spear and all the other stuff, that, you know, just – do that to be the best you can be for you. But that's not, you know, the patient doesn't know that. Absolutely. And if you get to know them, treat them like family, kind of the golden rule thing. And then with that injection, I mean, that was our biggest thing growing up. We would had some bad experiences, like probably a lot of people in the 70s going to dentists. Uh, it, it hurt. I mean, the shot hurt. And sometimes they couldn't yeah. get a block on you or whatever it was that I realize now but going to a dentist where they shake that lip, you know, a little bit and they don't show you the needle. They kind of hide it from you and it goes back in there. And I never really had any anterior shots, mostly just posterior. But what a difference when you can go yeah. in and you don't even basically feel the dentist. I mean, a guy could flick his finger on your head. It would hurt more than the shot. And it's just something yeah. It goes so far, even the talents of the dentist aren't, it's all going to be good for that patient. They aren't going to know that five surface amalgam or whatever. They're going to know that the doctor was nice. He's very personable. I didn't feel any pain. And I like this guy. And that's, that's 90% of it. If you can get that and then work skills, I mean, skills will come, but skills are important yeah. too. But you know, that's, I think that's your, uh, that's just great advice there. And I think with you, with that psych degree you have too, I, that's why you're hey. so, you're really good yeah. at you know, I lean that back. You can start telling me your problems too. Whatever you got to do, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and I let you know. You're talking about the the injection. When I was in dental school, my 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 junior year, um, we would have dental assistants that had been working in the school forever, and and uh, they would come around every once in a while because you had to like work with them to learn how to work with the dental assistant. But they were mostly not with you. But you know, I was always schmoozing with all of them. So in case they needed something, they would always come running, you know. And we had this one woman who had been there for like thirty something years at the school. I think her name is Beverly. She was awesome, and so she needed some dental work done. And she comes over to me one day. She goes, "Hey, Dr. Rosenblatt, can I ask you a question, a favor, more so?" I said, "Sure, Beth. What's up?" She goes, "I have to get some work done by a doctor. I'm not going to say who the doctor is because they may or may not still be at the school." And said, "I have to get work done by Dr. So and So." I said, okay. She goes, can you get me numb? I said, what do you mean? She goes, oh, I've seen everybody in the school give injections. You give the best injection I've seen in a long time. Yeah. She goes, I'm not letting you touch my teeth, but I'd love for you to get me numb. <laughs> I said, you got it. Uh, <laughs> so, dude, speaking about um, Sarek and stuff, let's talk a little bit of spare, uh, about Sarek and a little bit about uh, Scottsdale. But on the Sarek, yeah. how's that rolling now with the whole uh, Serona being bought out? Or how's that whole transition? And how's the Sarek world going right now? I remember, like you said, way back with Samir, he was doing that stuff when no one was doing it and posting you know, yeah. crowns and stuff. And I, I, I right at the same time. And even too with, uh, who is it? It worked with us forever. Uh, Mark Fleming, Dr. Fleming, is he still with Sarek too? And the yeah, guys? Yeah. So, 
So back in the day was, you know, when, when, when Belltown was kind of the wild, wild west days, yep. it was um, the early adopters were me, Armin, Sam, Flem, Todd Ehrlich was involved back then. Yep. Scrammy got in kind of early back then. And we were the only ones posting cases. And, you know, some of them looked okay. Some of them looked absolutely horrific. Yep. But, you know, that we just kept kind of pushing that envelope. And that's how I, we all became sort of friends was through the camaraderie of being kind of in the CAD CAM world and, and doing that and knowing that, knowing that this is where everything was going. And we just kind of got on it a lot earlier than, than a lot of people did. But um, now you changed I it. I mean, good. I was there on it too with you guys and you guys got beat up a little bit and then Samir and Samir is so freaking talented, but you guys stuck mm -hmm. with it. And a lot of guys in the background chatter, you know, because the, the restorations back in the day, I mean, it was the material you had to use. And then when I have a clear, you know, it, as it evolved, I mean, it really is quite an amazing setup. And uh, I'm a I lab just, guy, you know, but I've had this, this thing that back in the day, and I've, I've been using you a long time. And one of the main reasons I use you besides the fact that, you know, your lab always does, you, you're, you're, you just do a wide diverse amount of stuff. So mm -hmm. you can just, you're a one-stop shop and always do really good quality, but your personality and my personality are very similar in that, we just, there's very little filter there and yeah. you, have, you know, we're being pretty good on this podcast, I have to say, but you know, <laughs> you get us a couple of drinks in it. It's always fun to listen to. <laughs> and so, um, and I remember I had told you, and you probably, I don't even remember this, but I had said, listen, if I send you work and this is before I use the syrup, yep. I said, if I send you work and it sucks, you better not send me back a crown on lab work that sucks because then it's your fault that yeah. it's being remade. It's not mine. Exactly. If my work sucks, I want you to tell your lab guy, and you can write it in my file, hey, Dr. Rosenblatt, this is so-and-so from Keating Dental. That prep sucks. And <laughs> I wanted to hear him say it just because it made me laugh. Yep. So, I, and then I remember <laughs> getting the, I remember getting my CEREC in about six months after my CEREC, I got the CEREC. You had called me. You said, dude, did you get a CEREC machine? <laughs> and I said, yeah. I said, I know Keats. I'm probably not sending as much stuff. And he goes, dude, it's not, forget the stuff. We're, you're, I'm happy with what you're sending. He said, but your preps really are nice, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what the hell did my preps look like before, bro? <laughs> He's like, oh, they were fine. But, you know, I can really tell. And, I, and one thing you can always say when people are using that CAD cam and they're their oh. preps are blown up on the screen. They really become a lot more meticulous Absolutely. in what they're willing to send out to your into your lab. I don't know if you see that. I see it every day in the frickin' some of my best preps I get are Seric doctors. And I tell you, because they see it blown up. And I've said that for years. Like, I almost want to buy. I got some big cutters that, you know, do 20 grand in business a month just in lab work. And... I wish I'd get them a buy them a Seric or buy them a system that they have to see, you know, the high def five mag or whatever. It just yep. makes you a better praxin dentist because you can't really go to the next step if you can't read your margins. And my biggest thing yep. is like, oh, these Seric guys and these other guys, they're just freaking. Uh, and it, it's a it's a two, three month. It, it takes time and it's not free and it's not easy. You got to work at it a little bit, but what, it just gets your technique so much better. It's like, oh, I love the Seric guys. I mean, they're freaking talented, man. They're very talented. It's just, uh, man, what a difference. I mean, it's just, so I was thinking, give it to all my guys that are kind of tough preps here and there and give them a little bit of time on it and it's just gonna but uh no it's a, it's amazing the, the talent and you've heard me speak and yep. um and i've mentioned your lab a gazillion times in a lot of the, the courses i do and i love and, you for and that. Just, you know and what, you, what you guys do with um you know uh, you know you've been there a lot throughout the journey of stuff that i've done yep. over the years um you know, there's a, there's I've, I've used a, a, a wide variety of labs. Of, you know, some are very Seric specific yep. that really are. You know, that's their only thing. So on certain stuff, I'll go right to that. On the other stuff, I always kind of use you guys. Yep. And but you guys, um, I, I always love, and I and I will, uh, I like to quote labs like you that you know you're not you, you get your Seric users, but you're basically an analog. You use a lot of PBS, a lot of your docs, oh, and I love you. labs like you. That even though you get a lot of PBS. You understand the merits of what CAD CAM does for the dentist. Oh, we you know, do. as far as how how much how it takes their skill set up a notch because it has to. Oh, it's it's so amazing. I mean, I like even it. too, we've we've changed in the last five, 10 years so much, but we still do thousands of, uh, PFMs, you know, a week. And yep. it's, uh, it's a beast, you know, it's so much more labor intensive and 
it's just such a crapshoot sometimes, you know, when you got impressed materials shrinking and, you know, alloys liking to expand and contract. And then I got oxide layers to deal with. It's just on and on. But yeah, I'm not complaining, but I just think dentistry as a whole is just technologically getting so much better and predictable. It's just amazing. You know, it really is. And even seeing what you guys are doing, um, out there at Scottsdale, you know, we're big Koi's guy. I know Koi's and Spear. What's, what's that Frank Spear like, man? I've never heard him, and I just – I hear he's such a legend, man. I, I, he looks like a pretty big, beefy dude. I mean, what's he like a little bit out there <laughs> working with him? He looks like he'd be my big yeah. brother. <laughs> you know. He's a really great guy. He's very, very quiet. He's a very quiet guy. Um, okay. You know, he's certainly not – you know, you're not, he's not running around with a big personality like you or I or somebody like that. And, and the one thing I, I love – about you know being part of the sphere faculty on the on the CAD CAM side, but in going to a lot of the courses and stuff that Frank has taught and, and Greg Kinzer and, and Gary DeWood and and uh, Darren Deister, guys like that that are out there in that uh, in the on the faculty out there mm -hmm. is they they teach from the, the very course like also they the reason that course is so popular is course teaches from failure not from success. Okay, and I think that the, the really great people that teach you comprehensive dentistry, the ones that want to sit there and just show you case after case of, oh, this is easy and this is all you have to do yeah. and, and show you one wonderful case after another. The reason the case looks wonderful most of the time is because of talented ceramists like you guys yeah, exactly. making, you know, mediocre people look great. Yep. Uh, Frank, you know, and, you know, do like you say, you're with you, John. Yep. They're, you know, they work together, but they, they, they both teach from that failure perspective to say hey listen i did this case this failed yep. here's why and you're looking at this going oh my god i have cases like that all the time exactly. and instead of just seeing one masterful case after another you're seeing one failure and how you fix it that to me is the ultimate way to teach somebody how to be better oh absolutely. you know as i said earlier i don't have a problem i don't ever want to paint a picture of me being this guy who just because i'm out 35 weeks a year 40 weeks a year sometimes teaching and, I'm, and I've slowed that down tremendously now. I don't teach anywhere near as much mm -hmm. as I did the previous decade. You, I don't ever want somebody to think that, you know, just because I'm in front of a room means that I'm doing full mouth rehabs all day. I, yeah. I just, my last patient was two fillings and a crown. I just do quadrant dentistry in the posterior yep. all day long. I'm, I'm a 90% onesie, twosie guy is what I, you know, I mean, I like doing the bigger cases, but you, know, you just, I don't have that kind of practice. I have a very... An older family style practice, and that's the way I like running it. It's and fun. I think so I, I think ninety percent of dentists in the nation are onesie twosies. Really, I mean, yeah. it's bread and butter dentistry is what's out there. The big roundies and all that stuff are few and far between from the eighties and nineties and the boom days. You know, believe me, I I've got so many guys with limited to cosmetics. Well. Now they're limited to a little bit of everything. It's kind of like the lawyers out of good friends of a criminal lawyer. Well, now he does everything because, you know, the crime's gone down here in Southern Cal and they got to do labor law. They got to do, you know, several different law. You know, same thing with dentistry. You know, you maybe. You're doing roundhouse sealants now, right? Yeah, two sealants <laughs> like freaking uh, Clayton. <laughs> Practice limited to sealants. Ah, <laughs> uh, dude. So. Tell me a little bit about Fleming, Mark Fleming. I remember, shit, last time uh, we are Fleming, uh, we are in Chicago at the midwinter, and then we, I always do the parties at Ditka's, you know, because I made yeah. all Ditka's oh, teeth. And I remember one of the first years, we're with Mark Fleming and my wife and a few other doctors, and we go in there and uh, we go upstairs and, and I go, hey, there's uh, Mike Ditka and uh, Erlocker was at the table and he had a couple of Marines. And I said, I know that dude, Fleming. I go, we, uh, I did all his upper and lower teeth. We've done him twice because he's like a pit bull. He breaks his teeth. And he's like, no, you don't. No, you didn't. I go, watch this. Come on. I said, hey, Dr. Ditka. Hi, I'm Sean Keating. I'm the one that made your teeth. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wynn out in uh, Florida. He goes, oh, yeah, Dr. Wynn, a little small Asian guy. I said, yeah. Yeah. He goes, yes, Sean, these things keep, man, they're loose down here. Shake them. We'll go, just let him know. We'll redo them. No charge. He goes, man, I love you, Sean. I mean, it's just so cool. And then the years after, we, uh, we'd we get a little room and rent it there and have a, you know, party at Ditka's. And, he, you know, I see him once in a while. But uh, he's kind of a, you know, he, he's pretty new. Yeah, I remember but, those parties. Those were awesome. Yeah. So I got, like, Ditka. And I also did Butkus, a bunch of his teeth. Uh, and he's our uh, one of our... Uh, want to sponsor like he uh 
one of our spokespeople he does for my um for my Bruxers. Remember him biting on a rock years back and stuff. So I, I still see him. We have the same cardiologist, so we know each other from there too. But uh freaking Butkus and Ditka, man, those couple of Chicago boys there, you know. Uh hardcore. Hardcore, man. So dude, tell me a little bit about um with your uh Sarek um and your uh you know, you're lecturing, you're kind of call, you know, doing less and less. Are you out Scottsdale a lot? Are you going across the nation? No. Or are you Scottsdale? Tell me a little bit about that. When, when, so, you know, it started out, I was doing a lot of, you know, when, when it was just Patterson, because you were asking about like the, the climate early about that, you know, with dead spy and stuff. Yeah. And it's definitely the weirdest time for me that I've seen in a while, because now we have Henry Schein and Patterson selling everything, not just one selling Sarek, they're all selling all the systems out there. Okay. So, um, you know, I've been a Patterson guy for a long time and I've kind of stayed with them. And um, they, uh, you know, have Clark coming out with their new milling unit coming this this, yeah. this week in, in the winter. And, and even so, Glidewell's got their little mill too. <laughs> they're a, the Glidewell IO or something. Everyone and their brothers in this. So that's really where everything's going. So it's certainly interesting to be a part of it. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot of changes, a lot of personnel changes that, you know, I've known a lot of people a long time because yeah. I've been, you know, I'm kind of an OG now, you know, in the CERIC world, as yeah. far as I'm, this is my 15th year using CERIC. I yeah. started in 2003. Yep. So, you know, I was one of the uh, beta testers early on with, Absolutely. you know, Sam and all those guys too. So, um, and Flynn and all them. So you, you really have, um, you know, it's kind of like a little cool little, you know, fraternity sorority kind of a you know the guys and gals that were doing it oh, yeah. now um after that so i was doing a lot of stuff for patterson trying to do teaching stuff around the country and then sam moved out to scottsdale flynn moved out to scottsdale mike scramstead teaches exclusively at scottsdale so he just goes back and forth from his practice a couple of days a week and teaches in in scottsdale okay. uh and runs the you know all the academic stuff with sam out there so, so those three basically run most of the courses out that way. Okay. So they're now building a facility out on the East Coast in, um, no, not them, but, you know, Serona, you know, they're, 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 that building starting out there in uh, the spring. Uh, no, it's going to be done kind of uh, late summer. And so there'll be classes both East Coast and West Coast now, which is kind of fun. So okay. hopefully I'll get a chance maybe to do some stuff out there. We do a teaching. Sarah Docs has a thing with, with Serona. I mean, with Patterson and, and also with Shine, where we go out and do um, court, hands-on two-day courses for dentists who want to get into CAD CAM, okay. but don't want to just buy it and not go. Okay. So I run these courses all over the place and, and do them. So, you know, I teach a lot in Canada. I have a lot of good following up there. So I go up to Canada a bunch and, and do courses up there for them. And so, you know, I get to travel a lot. I mean, it's um, I used to average in the air – you know, 30 to 34, 35 trips, and then, you know, oh. six or eight local things here a year. So I was somewhere between 35 and 40 something weeks a year oh. teaching. I got married 21 years, and probably that's the reason because yeah. who the, I can't stand me seven days a week. So I'm sure my wife is thrilled with the break. And my, you know, I have three kids, I have one in college. It's at University of Wisconsin Madison. Oh. Uh, she's, a, she's in an engineering school there. She wants to be a biomedical engineer. Oh, that's cool. or something. I don't know what else she wants to do. And then my son just got into the same school, so he's going into computer engineering, computer science. Oh, and perfect. I have a little ten year old nugget. So you know, it got it got so crazy. And then with all of this kind of in, me buying the practice and and doing uh, the second practice and it getting busy here, I just decided that it was start. It's time to start focusing. A little bit this place is building so much yeah. that time to start focusing stuff here so i got i got a consultant for the practice to help me kind of manage the business because i didn't know what the hell i was doing absolutely and um you know the the lecturing kind of cut back a little bit and so now you know i'll probably do maybe 15 18 this year instead of 40. okay and you know what that's if i can be 20 or less i think i'll be thrilled oh that'll you know, be, it'll get yeah. me out enough yeah get me out enough to get me around and see my friends and um you know, I'll try to get out to Scottsdale maybe two or three times a year, but you know, I don't really have to do too much because Sam and, and Scram and them, they're they're the, the, the head honchos over there. They do all of the, the courses and do such an amazing job what of a... you know, talk, talking about creating a family atmosphere and making people feel welcome and it just they, they do such a beautiful job over at the center. 
Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel that. And I, I know Samir a little bit, too. And uh, he was one of our first guys to come here and do an over-the-shoulders when we opened us in 2002. But it's something, um, well, it was 2004 or so when he came by here. But it was just something um, about him especially. I mean, I just, I just seen, too, he's on, the I think, Dentistry Today, the cover there. That's pretty neat for, you know, yeah. so- SoCal Sam. is No uh, no more SoCal. I, mean, I can't believe he moved out to the desert. What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> but, I guess it's getting real nice out there. I mean, a lot of, a lot of big time well, companies are out it, there, and there's just a lot of money. It's like yeah, a, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's a what a what a facility they built too, and it's just uh, hey man, if I was a dentist starting off, I would be paying that bucks. You know, yeah, I'm in debt, whatever, but I would learn from those guys over there, either them and Coys, and get in some implant training. But I would learn yeah. from the best because it's your, it's just kind of like you know, it's your, it's your foundation, and you know, you can go mentor. Like you were lucky to have a mentor like you had, plus your dad. That's great, but you know, with you yeah, even in the trenches, you, you talk about all these mentors and stuff and it doesn't have to be people like that were ahead of you i look at guys like samir and, and you know armin back in the day i look at guys you know like when uh, uh t-bone was a huge mentor in my life yeah. Lem, like those guys and they were all like dental town guys yep. that you you um you know we had this great little community and everybody kind of looked out for each other yep. and listen i mean a lot of guys went and grew businesses together and did all these things and yeah. you know that's how i became faculty at, at scottsdale sam just they didn't know they were growing at a rate that they couldn't handle and they took guys like myself and scrammy and darren greenhall and pete gardell and a guy and just, you know went back in the early days and said hey we just need you guys to help manage the boards and help us with some classes and can you do that you know it, and that's kind of how it rolled. It was a friendship sort of a thing. Yeah. I trust you guys, and I think we'll be great together. And, you know, we've been a pretty happy family for 10 years oh, now. Yeah. Going on, on I mean, some- I mean, you guys are like the founding fathers of it all from way back. I mean, and it's something... You know, even with us here, I mean, there's a lot of guys from dental time. I mean, back then, I mean, now I see all my buddies and stuff and I, I see this Facebook stuff and I'm just so not into the Facebook like I was with dental town back in the day. It was like the Wild West with us. And that was our Facebook back in, you know, 03, 04, 05, you know. And, oh, yeah, and on was. and uh it was just like oh what's going on and a lot of people like you know cut their chops there and a lot of guys uh started their careers there and i'm one of them um, where you know i left after you know almost 17 plus years and then i started my own and i met some dentists and i mean it was a great thing and to see you guys all just succeeding i just love it man and i just think uh yeah, yeah god bless you all with that that's just uh it's so neat you guys stick together and i think right now with you especially getting a little bit more back involved cutting back to, you know even if you're under 20 you know uh you know trips you know a year you with the, getting an associate you really could crush it because you're such a good person and you got your skills and you just get your systems in place like you said get that little management system in there a little bit just to you know with you know structure and it's so important but once you do that i see you getting another third and fourth practice in different areas and it's just a matter matter of um just properly managing them and you know there's a lot of guys a lot of dentists don't want to do any of that and i just think with a little bit of structure with you i could see a two three four practices and not working any harder just working smarter but a lot of dentists don't want to do that little stuff that's why they want to go work for practice management places like that you know but they just don't want to deal with it and i remember with me when i started my lab the hardest thing was all the business part but you know what did i do i surround myself with people that do all that and I don't even, you know, have to do any of that. I just do what I do. And that's any great successful company and, the uh, you know, the successful CEO or whatever. They do what they do and they surround themselves with great people and find the people. And it's always, you know, uh, trying to, you know, fit the right people in. And, you know, after a while, you know, you, like you got, you got people that have been there for 20 plus years and it's a good system. And I tell you, you guys are, you guys are just going to blow up in the next few years. I bet you, because, you're just too good of a guy and you got your skills and people like you. And that's what it's all about. And I just think, um, God, good for you, Rich, man. I'm, I'm very proud of you, man. I've seen you come a long way, baby. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I was like, you know, it wasn't doing anything. I was a, a little peon uh, associate just trying to, you know, cut some teeth, literally my own and, and, and the ones that, that were sitting in front of me. And it's, it's been a great, you know, it's been a great journey. I look at what these kids coming out of school now have to kind of deal with because of the 
the change in the landscape with the expense of school getting so insane and the amount of debt coming out. So they're kind of forced to, you know, I think, you know, I was talking to um, some of these kids where I put in an application for my, or an ad for my, my associate position a few mm-hmm. months ago in the Chicago Dental Society magazine. And, you know, I had all these fourth years that were coming out of school saying, oh, you know, I, I they get really nice resume and get your cover letter, yep. very eloquent and stuff. And I'm going, I don't want to be the residency program, yeah. but these kids can't afford to go into residency. Yeah. They're coming out of school with four hundred, five hundred thousand yeah. dollars in debt or more, yeah. you know, and and not low, low not low interest rates. So they got thousands and thousands of dollars a month. They need to make six figures coming out of school, and you know, they're not going to make that in my office. You yeah, know, that's and, tough. you know, the amount of debt. So it's it's you know they will if if they were working full time they'd be great. But right now I don't have all those days to give us. I'm starting to grow the office bigger. You know, I have somebody here who's willing to grow with me. My associate knows I have two days a week for her and a third day, probably sort of prime for about six months from now. And we'll, you know, as the office space grows, then we'll kind of grow and we'll market more and do all those kind of things. So it's very controlled, but you know, I don't necessarily want to grow like you were saying, I really want to turn this place into something that I think is something I'm proud of, uh, something I work hard on and, and that, you know, I, that people can walk out of there feeling like, even though the office is busy, they were still treated like an individual who mattered. Absolutely. You know, that's really a big thing for me. Well, dude, I know you're going to blow it up and you're going to be successful. You already are successful, but hats off to you, Dr. Rosenblatt. Rich, my man. <laughs> I want to thank you. Uh, time has run out. We have uh, we've uh, hit our time limit. <laughs> Beautiful. Dude, thank you so much. So I, I'll see you this uh, in uh, Chicago. You doing something on Friday night, are you? Are you still doing it? I know Scotty can't go. Uh... I have a couple of the, uh, I have some with Ivan Clark and some with uh, Kirari, uh on Thursday and Friday night. So I'm not. I can't actually do my dinner. Actually. Saturday night, we're doing, you'll even Saturday, right? Yeah, at least Saturday, but uh, we'll hook up. We'll figure out sometime. I know I got Thursday and Friday, too, but uh, we'll hook up for some cocktails some night or whatever. We'll I'll, I'll text you, see where you're at, and we'll meet up, have a cocktail. Maybe we, uh, I know Scotty was talking about going to Winter Circle. It's like, my wife's like, oh, we're not going there again. Remember that? That was Dude. good times. <laughs> Yeah, come on, a limo and a $100 bill. Let's do this. <laughs> I know. I bought like 40 hot dogs. We just ate it. I go, yeah, give me 40. <laughs> She's like, what? Oh, <laughs> God. Well, hey, Rich, man, thank you so oh, much, dude. Yeah. I, I know you're swamped today, and I know uh, I wanted to get one in before uh, the Chicago, everyone's leaving out tomorrow. So I just wanted to thank you for this so much, and for, thank you for all the work through all the years. And if there's anything I can ever do, baby, just let me know. You got it, man. I, I look forward to seeing you as always. Tell your amazing wife, Shan, I miss her, and I will hope to catch up with you both soon, all right? All right, Rich. Thanks again, and we'll talk to you real soon. Hey, I want to thank everybody for joining us on the Dental Up podcast show this week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or search Dental Up Podcast on iTunes and get our weekly feed. Don't forget to visit KeatonDentalArts.com slash promo for exclusive offers. Keaton Dental Arts is a full-service dental laboratory, and we're nationwide. We would love for you to send us a case so we could show you the Keating difference. If you dig what you've heard, please leave us a review on iTunes, and we'll be back next week.